We're going to continue reincarnation. We said last time that reincarnation, contrary to popular belief, is a very Jewish concept. It goes all the way back to the Tanakh. We saw a few verses in Tanakh that speak about reincarnation. The main one in Job, in the book of Job, Eov, where it clearly says that God does this, pa'amayim shaloshim gavir, that God does this twice or three times with a person, that he takes the person out of the, of the grave and brings them back to life, out of the pit and brings them back to life. Two or three times he does this, and we saw how that corresponds right to what Moshe said in the Torah, in Exodus, in Shemot, where God revealed his 13 attributes, and it says that God passes sins down to the third and fourth generation. And we saw how it doesn't make sense to say that the sins of the fathers passed down to the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to the third and fourth generation, because the Torah also clearly tells us that everybody is responsible for their own sins. Everybody, ish becheto yumatu, that everybody dies, everybody should die for their own sins. It's not fair that you should suffer for the sins of somebody else. If they're your parents, your grandparents, it's irrelevant. Everybody should suffer for their own sins. And Yechesket, we didn't quote this last time, but Yechesket, the prophet, reinforces this and says this again. Yechesket also says, a nefesh achotet hitamut. It's the soul that sins that should die specifically. Ben lo isa be'avon ha'av. A child shouldn't, shouldn't suffer the sins of their parents or carry the sins of their parents. And ve'av lo isa be'avon ha'ben. And a father, a parent, shouldn't suffer for the sins of their child. Tzitkat ha'tzadik alav. The righteousness of the righteous is upon them. And verishat arasha alav tihyeh. And the sins of the wicked are upon the wicked, and the righteous good deeds of the, of the righteous are upon them. So everybody pays for their own sins. Everybody earns their own mitzvahs, their own merits, and their own demerits. So it wouldn't be fair to say, and it makes no sense to say, that the sins of parents pass on to the children. And as the Arizal explains, what the, that actually means in the 13 attributes of mercy, what that actually means is that your own sins pass down to the third and fourth generation, which is what Eov was saying. Pa'amayim shaloshim gavir, that God does this to you two or three times, he brings you back into this world two or three times, meaning he gives you up to three chances, so you have four lifetimes. First lifetime, second lifetime, you know, third lifetime, the third chance that God gives you would be your fourth lifetime. You have four chances, three strikes, and then if that didn't work, then we have to take more uh, serious measures. But that's really what Moshe was saying to the third and fourth generation. You're given four chances, essentially, assuming that you get worse. But, notzel chesed le'alafim, when God says that he extends kindness to thousands of generations, what does that mean? It means that as long as you are improving with each reincarnation, then you can keep coming back and you keep, you're given more and more chances to get better, to fulfill more mitzvot, to purify more mistakes, to rectify more mistakes that you've done in the past. So as long as you're improving with, re, re, with each reincarnation, then it's notzel chesed le'alafim. Then God is giving you, God extends his kindness to thousands of generations. But in the case that a person is getting worse, with each reincarnation, then they have three strikes and then they're out. So that, we said that last time. And we also saw the biblical term for reincarnation. Although today we call reincarnation Gilgul, that's a later term. In the, in the Tanakh, it's a Gilgul. So what is the biblical word for reincarnation? The slingshot, right? The cosmics and kafakela, kafakela, which comes from the prophetess of Igail, that Abigail told David that the enemies of God will be flung from a kafakela, from like the sling, from the, uh, like a cosmic slingshot. And the, both the Zohar and the Arizal say kafakela is reincarnation. The Zohar says, how do people reincarnate? Like a stone in a sling, like they're getting flung from one body to another, so to speak. The metaphor is a slingshot. That's why the biblical word for reincarnation is kafakela. That's, we said that as well last time. Where do you know about Gilgul? Gilgul is a later rabbinic word, which I guess just means to roll over. So, you're right. That your soul rolls over from one body to another. Yeah. Recycles, rolls over. That's the idea. And we saw the Arizal give us five reasons for reincarnation. What were those five reasons? The five main reasons that people reincarnate. Anybody? 
Okay, yeah, that was later. Number one was, <clears throat> number one was that the person transgressed something that they weren't allowed to do. So you have to come back and stop doing it, right? And rectify and fix the sins of that and maybe perhaps suffer some penalty. So number one is for a transgression, for having transgressed a negative mitzvah, something that you're not allowed to do. Number two is having not fulfilled a positive mitzvah. You didn't do something that you were supposed to do, whatever it is. Maybe it was not giving enough tzedakah money, you didn't give enough to charity, or you didn't do you fulfill the mitzvahs of tefillin or Torah study. And we saw Torah study in particular, the Arizal says, you have to study on all four levels. If you only study pshat your whole life, and you're just going to read the simple stories, you know, the, the simple narrative superficially, you're going to have to come back. The Arizal says you will reincarnate until you understand you study Torah properly on all four levels, pshat, remez, drash, sod, down to the secrets, down to the mysticism, down to the gimatrias. Every, you have to understand all aspects of Torah, not just the simple stuff. So a person will reincarnate even for that. So a second reason was for failing to fulfill a positive mitzvah. Yeah. Yeah. Pshat remez drash sod means you study the Torah. Pshat means just superficially, the simple narrative, the sequence of events. Remez means what do you get from the story? What is the message of the story? What is the lesson of the story? Reading between the lines. Drash is metaphor, analogy, allegory, interpretation of a higher degree. And finally, sod means secrets, the, like the mystical aspects of the Torah, the Torah codes and all that stuff the spiritual dynamics and things. And that's in, in brief. We can expand on it later another time. But that's, those are the four levels in brief. So that's the second reason. And then the third reason was a more positive one that has less to do with you, but more to do with others, that you're brought back into this world because you're needed here. You are needed for some purpose. Your soul is needed. It has some particular a uh, mission to accomplish to help others, to help others fulfill their mission. Maybe you need to come here to save other people's lives or whatever it is. So the third reason is more of a positive reason. It's not because of something you did wrong. It could be because of something you did right. And because you're good at it, God says, okay, we need you back on earth to take care of this. So that's number. And then he gave two more reasons that have to do with soulmates. The first one is you didn't marry your soulmate. That's important. You have to make sure you marry the right one. How do you know you married the right one? That's a other, quite different question. But chances are, if you got married, it, you're probably, it was meant to be. Chances are it was meant to be. So you should have said, <laughs> you can, listen, that's number five. Reason number five is you got married, but you got divorced. Now you have to come back and you're going to have to try again. So reason number five is you did marry your soulmate, but something went wrong. So that's also a reason to come back. And uh, or reason number five, more specifically, is that um, you married your soulmate, but you made some terrible sin and then you have to come back. You have to come back and then you're going to drag your soulmate along with you because you need your soulmate to help you. Where we ended off last time is that the, the critical point, which some people found a little controversial and I got a lot of emails and, and comments and flack about. This idea that the Arizals, not me, the people who are arguing weren't arguing with me, they were arguing with the Arizal. Because the Arizal is saying that the soul cannot experience pain. The soul is pure, the soul is divine. The body can experience pain, yes. The soul doesn't experience pain. The body is frail and weak and can suffer. The soul can't suffer. So the Arizal says that's why you need reincarnation, because if a person needs to pay for their sins and needs to be punished, there is no some magical place where people suffer somewhere, we don't know how, this eternal image of some eternal damnation in some place of fire that other religions like to speak of a lot. That's not a Jewish and authentic Jewish concept. We said, hold on, hold on, hold on, we're getting there. So we said that the Torah itself, the Chumash mentions, no, has no concept of an eternal hell. It doesn't mention it. Right? And the Tanakh, the whole Tanakh doesn't really mention it. It doesn't describe it. Maybe it mentions something like it in passing, but it never describes it. And we said that the word Gehenom itself 
Where is Genom? Genom literally is a place outside of Jerusalem. Today it's an actual park and has a really nice walking trail. So actually, I've, I've been there. No, I've been there. And one day I went for a walk there and it's actually really peace. Nobody's there. And as you walk, it's like it's very calm and, and serene. I actually had a really amazing encounter and experience in that valley once. Seriously, one of the most spiritual uh, experiences I had in my life. This is back in uh, 2010. So I'll share it another time. Not for now. But remind me one day to tell you my story in Gehenom. Because it's, uh, <laughs> it's an amazing... <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it for another time. So, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. We'll get to Korach. So the Torah does mention a Sheol, right? like an underworld. But we have to define, well, um, he, it's where it's coming. We're going to talk about Korach a lot later on. So generally speaking, Gehenom is literally a place on earth. The Tanakh doesn't actually describe, it was a place of sinners. That's where sinners used to congregate outside the old city walls. That's where there was all kinds of witchcraft being done. There were lepers and there was a child sacrifice and idolatry. All the undesirables of Jerusalem who were kicked out of the city would congregate in this valley outside the old city walls. And that's why the Tanakh describes it as a place of sinners, as a terrible place. It's also called Tophet because there was a place, it means drums. It was a place of noise and cacophony and weird witchcraft rituals and so on. So Genom is a place here in the Tanakh, right? The Tanakh doesn't actually mention some eternal place, some other dimension of, of suffering, that's not, that doesn't appear. So the Arizal says that suffering can only happen in, in really in this world. Just like Gehenom was in this world, the soul needs to come back into a body. And he didn't invent this idea because we saw, that's where we ended off, we saw that there's a famous Gemara where Rabbi Yehuda Nasi is speaking to the, the Roman Emperor Antoninus. And the Antoninus challenges him and says, how can you believe in this idea? You know, we, we saw, we, he, there was this parable, remember, that Antoninus said the soul is going to say, I didn't sin, it's the body that sinned. And the body is going to say, I didn't sin, I'm just a body, I'm just a hump of carbon. What is, I didn't do anything. It's the soul that animated me, it's the soul that, has all the, that made all the choices. So, and Rabbi Udanasi answered him with a parable and said, no, what happens is God brings the body and soul back together and then he judges them. And then he gives them their reward and punishment. That's where we left off. We left off with the idea that reward and punishment is actually back here on earth when body and soul come together. So only the body can suffer pain and really only the body can, can experience pleasure the, going the other way. Because you have to remember that Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, was also here on earth. We tend to think of Gan Eden as somewhere else. There are souls in Gan Eden somewhere. But Gan Eden was also in Tanakh is literally here on earth. Adam and Eve were given delights here on earth, right? God made Adam and Eve on earth and said, here, this is your place of pleasure. So pleasure is also experienced here by the body. That's why we have this whole concept of a resurrection of the dead. In, after Mashiach comes, at some point, all the righteous dead will come back to life to, to receive their reward here. And the rewards are always described in very physical terms. Many, all the stories in Tanakh, in Midrash, that speak of rewards in Olam Abba, they're all very physical. In one place it says that a person gets 310 Olamot, Shai Olamot, or Yesh Olamot, that's the Gimatria 310. In another place it says you get rivers of gold. In another place, you know, there's that famous story of the rabbi who was so poor that he asked for a, a little piece of his reward from the afterlife, and he got one leg piece, the, the leg of a t table, that was gold. In the after, you remember the story. <laughs> yeah, in the afterlife, he had a table made of gold. So he got a table, you can imagine, like a, a few bars worth of gold, right? It's a lot of money. So you can live for the rest of your life with that. He got like one table leg full of gold and his wife saw it and says, what are you talking about? I want that table for the afterlife. Give it back, right? <laughs> That's my afterlife table. So what do you get from that story? That there's, in the afterlife, there's physical, a physical golden table. He was able to borrow a material piece of gold from the afterlife into this world. So all the stories in the Gemara, and I'm going to mention some more, all speak of very physical rewards and punishments here in this world. So that's really important to remember, that Judaism doesn't have a concept of 
really of an eternal hell for sure. And we said how the concept of eternal suffering makes no sense. It's against the principle of midah keneged midah, that God is measure for measure. God does everything precisely. So an eternal suffering does not fit finite sins or finite people. A finite person doing finite things, it wouldn't, wouldn't make sense for them to merit an eternity of suffering. That's not midah keneged midah. The math doesn't add up over there. And plus it contradicts many other principles, including the fact that God is a good God, that God is, you know, notzer chesed la'alafin, that God is erech that God is long-suffering and kind and merciful. So how does it make sense that a good God would make you, knowing in advance when he made you, because he is omniscient and knows everything, then he made you and he already knew that you would fail and he's already made you knowing you would suffer for eternity in hell. It doesn't make sense. It's like the game is rigged and you're doomed to fail. So it doesn't make sense. So we discussed all that last time. I want to clarify one thing before we move on, which is that uh, a few people that emailed me with their concerns about this idea pointed to a few places in the Gemara, one place in particular in the Gemara in Masachet Rosh Hashanah, which they say, you look, you see here, they're saying this implies an eternal hell. And they point to this Gemara, Rosh Hashanah, page 17a. And actually... The Gemara says the exact opposite. The Gemara actually says that Genom is not eternal. It lists who are the people that get this Gehenom suffering, and it says who they are, various heretics and informers in Epikosim, and it says, Yordim le Gehenom venidonin ba le dore dorot. That's what it says. So these people, these wicked people, will go to Gehenom and be judged there le dore dorot for literally many generations. So some people point to this and say, look, you see, there's an eternal damnation in Gehenom. But this doesn't say eternal. This just says dore dorot. It just says for, many, for multiple generations, literally generations of generations. But it says and that there is a Gehenom. No, no, there is a Gehenom. We're not denying that there's a Gehenom. Hold on, we're going to put everything together. Right. We're just saying that Gehenom is here. But we're not denying that there's punishment for sins. And so they're going to Gehenom for multiple generations. Dorei Dorot does not mean eternity. And what's funny is the verse continues, the passage continues and actually says, Gehenom Kale, that Gehenom will end. That it actually tells you that Gehenom is not eternal. And then it continues and says, Vehen Einan Kalin, but those wicked people will not end. So what do you take from that? One way of looking at it is, look, you see, they're going to suffer forever. Meaning even when Gehenom will end, they will keep suffering. But that doesn't make sense. If Genom ends, then how can they keep suffering? Genom is the place of suffering. Well, so the Gemara is clearly... Suffering unless you have a body. That's right. But that conflicts with what you're saying. No, it doesn't. You think they're going to that valley in Israel? No, let me, let me clarify. I don't mean that that valley in Israel is Gehenom. Nobody is suffering there now. People are tanning over there now and going hiking. <laughs> I mean, in general, your experience on earth can be a Gehenom or a Gan Eden. So what the Gemara here is saying is Gehenom will end. It actually says Gehenom Kale ve'hen Einan Kalin, which again, the Arizal might say that that means that, no, you see, their souls do their thing in Gehenom and then they continue. That means Gehenom will end and they don't end. They're coming back. They've rectified their sins. That's the, the verse. Gehenom kale ve'hen einan kalin. That even after Gehenom ends, because Gehenom is finite, it's not eternal. Gehenom is not eternal damnation. They will still be around. So even this passage in Rosh Hashanah is not talking about an eternal hell. It's saying people might suffer for multiple generations. The exact term is multiple generations. Dore dorot. And Gehenom kale. And Gehenom will end even if those particular people's souls won't end. Now we want to clarify this, this whole problem of Gehenom. Because on the one hand, we're saying, the story of Rabbi Yudah and Antoninus and many other places are saying, you need body and soul to come together to suffer. Gehenom requires a body. But then we have this idea that you're suffering in Gehenom. We said the Mishnah says that the suffering in Gehenom is up to 12 months. And we talked about Kaddish, how you say Kaddish for up to a year or 11 months because of this. So there is, the Mishnah actually gives a limit to the suffering. The Mishnah says the limit of suffering in Gehenom is 12 months. Where is that Gehenom? The Talmud and the Arizal are saying, but you need a body to suffer. So that seems to imply that you have to come back here when you have, where you have a body. And then a person would have to suffer 
a Gehenom for up to 12 months. So you have your three incarnations. Like we said, the Arizal said, if you keep getting worse, you get three chances to come back. You reincarnate three times. If a person got worse three times in a row, then they have to go to Gehenom. Where is Gehenom? It seems to be that it's back here because you need to come back into a body to suffer. Meaning, Gehenom is a, a further reincarnation here on earth, but now, not like the previous three, now where suffering is decreed upon you. An immense amount of suffering. That also actually solves another issue because we, had, we quoted two things from the Ariza last time, which is another passage where a person reincarnates not only in, in human form, but they might also reincarnate in an animal or in a plant or in something inanimate even, in a stone. How do you reconcile those two ideas? Those seem to be a little bit contradictory. So I reincarnate three times as a human, assuming I'm getting worse each time. But what about, at what point do I reincarnate as into an animal or into a plant or into a stone? That would be much worse. So this is where you can reconcile it all. And we're going to see how, actually, the Arizal himself gives a really detailed example that this is precisely what happens, is a wicked person, they are wicked, they come back, they're given another chance. As a human, with free will, almost like, almost like a blank slate, an opportunity to make up for the sins of their past life. The they, debt, there is a debt there that they have to make up, meaning, I mean blank slate, like you're still given free will, you're still coming back in human form, you can still in, enjoy more or less a normal life and make better choices. You're given another chance. You, you get worse again, you're given another chance. You get worse again, you're given another chance. At that point, the human experience is not working for you. So then you will, might be reincarnated in an animal form, in a plant form, in a rock form, that would be Gehenom. That's Gehenom because that's a horrible suffering. You can imagine a human consciousness in an animal that doesn't have the free will that you have, that isn't able to build relationships and have a birthday party and enjoy things and whatever, or even worse, in a stone. And we're going to see the Arizal give an example, a very beautiful example of somebody who indeed reincarnated three times, got worse each time, and finally came back in a stone. And he actually brings you scriptural proofs with exact verses how we know that that's the case. Whatever is decreed upon you, let's say Genom is 12 months, 12 months. You don't necessarily have to be stuck there. God put you in, God can take you out. That's one possibility, and we're going to see examples of that soon, of, coming, of your Gehenom being trapped in an animal or being slaughtered as an animal. So imagine that experience of coming back as, as, a, as an ant over and over again that keeps getting trampled and who knows. Some people deserve that kind of suffering. Could be that. So that's one possibility. And, or it doesn't have to be like that. It could be that your Gehenom is in human form, meaning 12 months of earthly suffering here. Just like we saw with Eov. Remember with Eov? Eov had intense, unbelievable, inexplicable suffering. And God gave Satan the permission to do that. We also have to look at Job's past life. Why did Job merit that suffering? We're going to get to that as well. But the Mishnah tells us that Job also suffered 12 months. And I believe that the secret of this Mishnah, if you really want to understand this Mishnah, it's all going to make sense now. I'm going to read the Mishnah again. There's five things that last 12 months. Mishpat Dora Mabul. The flood lasted 12 months. The suffering of the flood generation. It says, Mishpat Dor HaMabul. The judgment of the generation of the flood was 12 months, one year. Shnei Masar Chodesh. Mishpat Iov. The judgment of Iov. Shnei Masar Chodesh. Job suffered 12 months. Mishpat HaMitzri'im. The Egyptians, at, before the Exodus, suffered 12 months. Mishpat Gogu Magog. Le'atid Lavo. Gogu Magog, the final apocalyptic war before Mashiach comes, 12 months. And Mishpat Rashaim be Gehenom, and the wicked who suffer in Gehenom, Shnei Masar Chodesh, 12 months. Those five things are 12 months. I believe what the Mishnah is telling you here is that they're all the same. This is all the suffering of Gehenom. Job suffered hell on earth. The flood people suffered hell on earth. In fact, the Zohar tells you exactly that. The Zohar says, Tachaze, come and see. Noach Zaka hava atre bivnei dare. Noach, the righteous Noach, was going around warning people that the flood was coming, and of course, they did not listen to him. 
Ad the Kucha Brichu, what did God do? He brought about upon them Dina de Gehenom, the suffering of Gehenom. He brought on the flood generation the suffering of hell. My Dina de Gehenom, what is the suffering of hell? Asha Vetalga, fire and snow. Maya Vaesha, water and fire. Again, these are physical things, right? These are things that exist here on earth. What, what was the suffering? That's Nina Vedareticha, cold water, boiling water. Vechulo Bedina de Gehenom. This is the judgment of Gehenom. It is hot water on earth, cold water on earth, uh, snow, ice, like the winter in Canada. That counts as Gehenom. Six months in Canada, you have Gehenom. Six months of ice, six months of fire. So, we're experiencing that for more than 12 months in our lifetime. I guess we must be big sinners that we live in Canada. <laughs> But the good thing is we're, suff- we're, we're atoning for our sins. Yeah, yeah. If you were living in Florida, you don't atone. Well, then it's good to be here. <laughs> Over there, you make more sins. Here you atone for sins. So, yeah. exactly. oh, that's bad. <laughs> so they, the flood generations, idanu here, right? Ve'itavidu me'alma. Here in this world, they suffered Gehenom. So the Zohar is telling you they suffered 12 months. Six months of boiling water, six months of cold water, freezing water, ice and snow and so on. Because God brought about hell on earth. So this mission, I believe, is saying that the suffering, again, it's all saying it's all the same thing. That the wicked suffer, the Ganon could be here for up to 12 months. Interestingly, the Zohar here does mention a place called Avadon. Maybe you've heard of that before, Abaddon, Avadon. It, that's often used as well as a word to indicate like eternal damnation. But the Zohar, again, doesn't say that it's eternal damnation. It says that it's called Avdon or Avadon because that's where a soul would be essentially extinguished forever. Meaning if a soul is so unredeemable that it can't be purified, the Zohar says there's two possibilities. It says Sheol and Avadon. And man danachit le Sheol, if a person goes down to Sheol, which is like a, another biblical term, then he suffers a certain amount of punishment, mekabel anshe, and he would come out of there and go to another place. But there is a place where you can't come out of, and it's called avadon, because that's where that soul would be lost. Avid mikola, would be lost and cut off from everything. So again, this doesn't say that avadon is a place of eternal suffering. It says that that's a soul that would just be extinguished and will cease to exist. So some people were asking, what about something like a Hitler or some of these, like the cruelest dick tormentors of history? What will happen to them? You know, because of they made such evil choices, what will, surely they will never experience Olam Abba. Surely you're not going to see Hitler, Imach Shmo in Gan Eden somewhere in Latid Lavot. So what would happen to that soul? So after suffering for all the sins that he did. I don't know, six million reincarnations as an ant that gets squashed. Who knows? I don't know. But after suffering many, many reincarnations, then that soul would go to Avadon and be extinguished. As a person three times. And then Gehenom. Right? As a person three times, you have three chances to come back as a Gaver, as a human. Pamaim Shaloshim Gaver. And we'll see how that's possible, by the way. The Ariza will actually explain that you can take one soul and split it into a, a many sparks. You can split it into six million sparks if you wanted. There is such a thing called Avadon. The Zohar does in the same place speak about, and not just in the Zohar. The term comes from the Tanakh also. Avadon means a soul that's extinguished and is no longer needed. And that's also consistent with the Rambam. Interestingly, the Rambam Maimonides, in, the, in his commentary on the 10th chapter of Sanhedrin, he actually says... When he wants to explain Olam Abba, what does that mean? Kol Yisrael yesh lehem chelek le'olam Abba. That's how it starts. That all of Israel has a share in the world to come. The Rambam begins the commentary there by saying, there's no, nobody knows 100% what Olam Abba is. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And he says that among the Jewish people, he said, the Rambam says, there are actually five different views. And he doesn't discredit them. He doesn't say they're wrong. He says the Jewish people have five different views of the afterlife. And he goes through them. He says the first group believes that the afterlife is like this. 
And they have scriptural proofs for it. They have verses to support their belief. And the second group believes this. And the third group believes this. And he says each group has proofs to support their argument. And he doesn't say that they're, he doesn't discredit them. So these are all, he says the rabbis and smart people and Talmidei Chachamim have amongst them five different perspectives. Actually, it's four perspectives. And he says the fifth group is trying to bring all the other four together. That's kind of what we're doing. I think I, I, I'm more of like in the fifth group. Let's try to make sense of all of these sources. He says, one group believes in an eternal heaven and hell in some other dimension. Another group believes heaven and hell is here on earth. Another group believes this is. So the fifth group is trying to put them all together and explain them all, you know, whatever, synthesize them into one. That's kind of what I want to do. Then the Rambam says, I'm going to give you my, then he goes and gives his interpretation of the afterlife. And his interpretation is essentially the righteous and refined souls will have some everlasting bliss, and the wicked souls will ultimately just be extinguished. They will not merit any afterlife, and that'll be it. So the Rambam seems to say that, yeah, they'll suffer whatever they need to suffer as a punishment, what they earned, and then they just will not merit any everlasting bliss. They will just be extinguished. So the idea of Avadon is also consistent with the Rambam's view. Wait, a quick question. If revisiting that Mishnah, the five things that People like to say that Gogol Mago is going to take one year. Right. The simple shot of that Mishnah, in my mind at least, seems that the punishment of the person, Gog and the nation, Mago, if it's the other way around, their punishment is going to last 12 months. Yeah, that's what I want to focus on right now. So the Mishnah says that Gogu Magog is also 12 months. It doesn't say Gog's punishment is 12 months. It says that whole apocalyptic war lasts 12 months. Well, it says the right? punishment. It says Mishpat. Good. So meaning... If we are all alive during Gogu Magog, that means we are experiencing 12 months of punishment. We are part of that judgment. The judgment of this generation. It sounds like it's literally just the guy Gog and the nation Magog. It doesn't say Mishpat Gog. It says Gogu Magog, which refers to the war. The conflict is referred to as Gogu Magog, right? That's the name of the conflict, which is a global conflict. It doesn't just involve Magog, right? So that whole global, and that explains why the Gemara says it'll be such a horrible time that I'd rather not live to see it. Remember that Gemara where the rabbis say, I, let him come, but let me not see him. Gogu Magog is going to be such a terrible time to be alive. The whole world will suffer. So I believe what this is saying is, this is judgment day. We know that at the end of days, God is saying, I'm going to bring everybody back on earth and I'm going to judge them all. And they're all going to suffer here on earth. So one could argue that Gogu Magog is also hell on earth that this 12-month period will be an opportunity for God to cleanse everybody at the end of days before Mashiach comes and then it's the, the final end of the Olam Abba is here basically and we merit the final messianic age. Those who merit it will enjoy it and those who don't, won't. So I think you can also argue that that, that is the purpose of Gogu Magog. Why have Gogu Magog? Why bother? Why can't Mashiach just come and everything's fine? Why do you need an apocalypse of 12 months? So meaning the apocalypse itself is the judgment day. As the Tanakh says, right? The Tanakh actually says that God will judge us. There will be a judgment day. It's called judgment day for a reason. And it's again described as here on earth. So I think that's really what it's saying. And the Zohar again supports this. We mentioned it briefly when we did the class on Jewish Muslim history. If you remember that class, the truth about jo- uh, Jewish Muslim history. And the Zohar actually says that Zmin kut shabrichu le'achya lechol inun malchin. That in the end of days, God will reincarnate and bring back to life all the wicked kings of the past that tormented Israel. You remember this prophecy? Yeah. yeah. So uh, those that, the Akul Israel ve Yerushalayim, all those that tormented Israel and Jerusalem, uh, like Vespasian and Titus and Nebuchadnezzar and Sancheriv and all the tormentors of history, God will come back. All the other wicked political leaders in history from around the world will all come back to suffer their final punishment. So the Zohar supports this as well. And it says, when is this going to happen? In the time of, in the pre-Messianic, before Mashiach comes. So it seems like it's all pretty consistent here. That Gehenom is very much here on earth. Job experienced hell on earth. Gogu Magog will be a hell on earth experience for the sinners to weed out the good from the bad. And uh, for a lot of people as well, we all know, I'm sure, people who have suffered hell on earth. And this, this idea of understanding Gehenom as being here solves many problems, including the classic question of 
the theodicy question of how do, why do bad things happen to good people. Like any person who sees a child who's dying of some horrible terminal cancer, how do you make sense of something like that? Like that, there's no explanation for it. The only way to explain it is reincarnation. Because you have an innocent child who's done nothing wrong, nothing. Pure, pure, innocent, holy child. Whatever it is, five years old, ten years old, and they experience such torment and die. What could possibly be, how could you ever justify anything like that? You have to say that that's hell on earth. Does it get any worse than that? That, doesn't, that, that is hell. That's Gehenom. It doesn't get worse than that. Right? So it's almost, the, the reincarnation is the only way to explain something like that. The child does not deserve such pain. Maybe it's even Gehenom. And the parents, absolutely, absolutely. So reincarnation also solves that issue because without reincarnation, how do you explain that? How do you explain the suffering child who's innocent, he didn't deserve it. You have to say that he must have deserved it in a past life. Otherwise you have no explanation or you're left with a cruel God. And you'll notice many atheists make that argument, right? Many atheists will make that, how can you believe in a God when children go through that kind of suffering? So you have to have reincarnation. Otherwise, you have a, a, either an, an evil God or you're left with no explanation. Something doesn't add up. So I think reincarnation also solves this, this question. The idea is Genom doesn't have to be a specific geographical location. Genom can follow you wherever you are. Right? Genom is within you. Right? It's your mindset can make... I think it's... Maybe it was even Marcus Aurelius who said this, that your mind can make a heaven out of hell or a hell out of heaven. Last time we said that the gematria of Gehenom and Gan Eden is the same. Ge Ben Hinom and, and Gan Eden is 177, meaning it's really up to you. Your free will and your thoughts and your perception of the world, you can create your heaven or hell. It doesn't have to be a specific geographical loca location. Where Job was, for him that was Gehenom. And one last piece of, uh, of, since we talked about Kaddish last time, the origin story of Kaddish. What is the origin story of Kaddish? It's a Midrash. Do you remember the story with Rabbi Akiva? It appears in a few places in the Midrash with slightly different details. This is from Machzor Vitri. I just happened to pick this particular source. doesn't matter which source you pick. Uh, one day Rabbi Akiva was walking in the cemetery and he found he met a man who was all black like covered in coal he was carrying a heavy uh, load of spiky branches on his head and was clearly suffering Rabbi Akiva thought he's alive he sees a man covered in coal dust carrying heavy, spiky branches. He ran to him, he ran to him like a horse to help him really quickly. And Rabbi Akiva asked him, like, what's going on? What, what's your story? Who did this to you? Let me, let me take care of the problem. If you're a slave, let me go and talk to your master and I'll free you. So Rabbi Akiva wanted to help this poor man. He says, I'm actually dead. And every day my punishment is to go and chop wood. And Rabbi Akiva asked him, What was your work in the world from which you came? So, and he told him, I was a tax collector. You know, he would favor the, the rich and he would make the... Poor people suffer. He was a tax collector. And now his punishment is, again, coming back into this world, chopping trees. So the, the whole idea of this story is, and this is the origin of Kaddish. The story continues. I'm not going to read the whole thing. We don't have time. That ultimately Rabbi Akiva finds his son, teaches him how to read, brings him to the Bet Knesset so that he can say Kaddish, and this man is ultimately liberated. Okay, that's the origin story of why we say mourners Kaddish, of Kaddish Yatom which we said last time began only about 800-ish years ago, the custom of reciting Kaddish for the dead. And it's based on this Midrash. This is 2,000 years ago. Well, it's, the story is from Rabbi Akiva that happened 2,000, let's say 1,900 years ago, but the custom of Kaddish started to become widespread. It, maybe it was existed as a more mystical thing in the past. Can I Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be right away. Like Job. For 12 months, but it's not 
doesn't seem to have meant that it's, it's not. With it's not. But we're going to talk about that in the next class, about how time, the issue of time, and does it really matter for souls that are not bound by time. So again, even with the origin story of mourner's Kaddish, the, f- the punishment is here on earth. There's not some eternal dimension somewhere else. It's really reincarnation. It's suffering here. It's reincarnation or resurrection uh, are your only two possibilities. So Gan Eden and Genom is here. And ultimately the goal is resurrection. And that's what we pray for. We actually never mention, we don't say in the Amidah anything about an eternal heaven or hell. We do pray for the resurrection of the dead here. Jewish belief always, going back to the Tanakh, is that people will come back into this world. And that's the Daniel verse that you brought up. This is the verse. Many of those who sleep in the dust, they will come back to the life of this world. Right? So some people, tra- and, and others will suffer in this world. So again, the, the reward and the punishment is here in this world. Those who are sleeping in the dust will come back. So, so the way yeah, but you're helping them in that reincarnation, right? Maybe that's alleviating their suffering in that reincarnation. In the same way that you're saying Kaddish because you th- think that it's alleviating their suffering in Genom, you can just say that the Genom is here on Earth, and you're alleviating their suffering wherever they might be. Wow. Putting it all together with this verse. Some people also quoted this verse, commented and said, doesn't this mean chaye olam and dir on olam means eternal life and eternal suffering? Because olam, sometimes people translate it as eternal. But olam doesn't mean eternal, really. Olam means the world. So, right? says, so for the duration of this world. Because remember, there are many olamot. And we speak about the idea of cosmic shmitot. We want to talk about that as well in a separate class. We mentioned it briefly before, that there are cycles of civilization. It was actually, Rabbeinu Bechaya said it on last week's Parsha, that God cycles the world. There are 7,000 year cycles of civilization. That there's one olam, it's based on a midrash that says God is bone olamot umachrivan. Bone olamot umachrivan. God is creating worlds, destroying worlds. Creating worlds, destroying worlds. There's a 7,000 year cycle of civilization. We talked about this idea of 6,000 years of civilization as we know it. Then a seventh millennium, a final thousand years of pleasure. That's the Olam Abba, the Sabbath, right? The eternal Sabbath. You have a thousand years of Shabbat. And then what? Then according to the idea of cosmic Shemitot, God hits refresh and everything starts again. And you have a new cycle of civilization. And there's the 7,000, 7, 7,000 year, 49,000 year cycle of civilization. When we do Sfirat HaOmer now, it actually is a mini version of that, of counting seven days, seven weeks, 49 days. There is a cosmic Shemitah cycle of 6,000 years of civilization as we know it, a 7,000th of an eternal reward, uh, not eternal, of a millennium of Shabbat, of a millennium of joy and reward, and then hit refresh. Those are olamot as well. So when we say ad olam or le olam, it's meaning for the duration of this world. Olam just means world. That's the plain meaning. So people who are sleeping in the dust will come back into this world, come back to life in this world. Le chaye olam, to the life of this world. So that's Daniel as well. So putting everything together, and then we can continue our journey into reincarnation at some point. So this is what, what happens. A person, let's just summarize everything, and hopefully it's clear. A person comes into the world, it's their first try. They get worse, they come back again. They get worse, they come back again. They get worse, they come back again. Now it's their fourth chance at life. They've had three reincarnations. At that point... If they, saw, they get worse again, now they have to go to a Gehenom. They have to experience a Gehenom on earth. It might be like Job who suffered Gehenom 12 months. It might be like the flood generation that suffered 12 months. It might be in the form of an animal, like Nebuchadnezzar got into the form of an animal at one point as, as a punishment. It might be in the form of a, a plant or a stone or some Gehenom, some suffering on earth. It might be in the form of, God forbid, a child who's suffering, that's, which is otherwise inexplicable. Who knows? If they're so bad that they're like, they're irredeemable, the Hitlers of the world, then they're extinguished. That's it. They've suffered their whatever they were worth and uh, whatever they deserved, and then they're extinguished and no longer exists. Avadon. They're avud forever. They're lost forever. 
And then, on the other hand, if a person improves, they can keep coming back, even a thousand times, as long as they keep improving until they've rectified everything. And then what? Then you come back at, you do again, you also get one final reincarnation, not in Gehenom, but as a resurrection, as Tchayat Metim, which is Olam Abba, which is here on earth for your final thousand year millennium of joy and prosperity and reward, like Adam and Eve were meant to live a thousand years in the, in the Garden of Eden, right? So that's, those are your options. And if people say, again, the time question, a righteous person that died 500 years ago, Olam Abba is not here yet. We're not at 6,000. So what happens in between? So they don't have to wait because the soul doesn't have time anyways. God can take a soul forward a few hundred years. It's not a problem. Souls can go back and forth in time. A soul is not bound by time like the body. I believe that they're already in Olam Abba. They're already in the world of resurrection because we are here in 5784, but that doesn't mean that the year 6,000 isn't happening already. Past, present, and future could, are happening simultaneously. So you're essentially just looking at, we're, we're, it's hard for us to think outside of our limitations of time. We're so used to being limited by time. But that's what I want to talk about next class, God willing, is about time travel. Yeah, I wanted to do this before Shavuot. I don't think we're going to, because it's actually connected to Shavuot, because there's this idea that on Shavuot, at the giving of the Torah, time stopped. And there's a famous Chazal, the Gemara says that Moshe actually traveled through time. So I actually want to explore. I was going to do it before Shavuot. I don't think we'll have the chance to do it. But after Shavuot, maybe we'll do a class on time travel and how we deal with time and how the soul and the body experience time differently. Okay. At, so now we're at the resurrection of the dead. You have your thousand year reward. You have Shai Olamot. We talked about this before. A gift. Shai means a gift. And the Gimatria is 310. 310, you are given 310 worlds in this great vast cosmic universe to explore and delight in. You have all your, all the descriptions of our sages of material rewards of whatever it is, rivers of persimmon oil and gold and all the pleasures and all the things and no suffering and no, no evil and all of that. So when at the resurrection of the dead, classic question, who comes back? Which one of my reincarnations comes back? I had many different life forms probably many different bodies. So which body comes back? Which version of me will be in the resurrection of the dead? So the Arizal explains, back to Shara Gilgulim, When the time for the resurrection of the dead comes, Each body will take its portion of each of that soul. So, the soul is not one contiguous chunk. The soul has many, many parts and pieces, and each reincarnation is a different part of your soul. And at the resurrection of the dead, all of them will come back in their bodies. You will come back, and your past life will be a different person in their particular bodies. There will be many versions of you. It's almost like a multiverse. And the, the, uh, analogy, the analogy is... And the Zohar says, the analogy is a candle. So you're going to meet all versions of yourself? Right. You're going to be like, we share, you will know, we share one soul. You, I experienced this in this body and that body. The, the classic analogy is a candle. If you have a candle that's burning, so the, the, the wax is the body, the flame is the soul. And if I now want to light another candle from that candle, I can bring another candle, another body, another chunk of wax, and light it from this one, this burning one, and now I have two candles burning. I didn't diminish the flame. Did I diminish the flame of the first one? No, but now I have two flames. Two bodies, two flames. Now I can take another candle, and another one, and another one, and I can light a thousand candles from the one without actually diminishing the one. The one is still burning, and now there's a thousand copies of it, so to speak. So that's the analogy of using one candle and igniting other candles, other bodies with that same soul. And the Zohar says, this is the secret of the verse in, in uh, Proverbs, King Solomon said, Ner Hashem nishmat adam. Ner Hashem nishmat adam. The candle of God is the soul of man. That a soul is like a candle. That's, the secret. That's what King Solomon was trying to tell you. If you want to understand the soul, think of a burning candle. It doesn't diminish with more wax. You can keep making copies of that flame forever, really. And the Zohar adds, Mahu ner, what is ner? What does candle actually mean? The Nunun Resh, it's an acronym for Neshama Ruach. The soul and the spirit. Neshama and Ruach is ner. 
Uh, and it says that together, So the ner, the candle, is like the, your spirit and your soul, your neshama and your ruach in one. So that's what we're going to explore. We, we spoke about this before. Remember, generally, there are five levels of soul. The bottom level, the lowest level of your soul is called the nefesh. Then you have a ruach. Then you have a neshama. Then you have a chaya and yechida. The neshama is associated with the brain. But the ruach is associated with the heart and the lungs and the vital organs. And the nefesh is associated with the blood. That's why the Torah says over and over and over again that the nefesh is in the blood. Adam wa nefesh, a nefesh badam. It says over and over again that the nefesh is in the blood. The ruach is associated with your other vital organs, your liver, your heart, your lungs. Your neshama is associated with your brain. The chaya is associated with your aura. And the yechida is something even more ethereal. And it's like a described as like a divine um, umbilical cord that connects you to God. So you have five general parts to your soul. And the Arizal adds to that in Shara Gilgulim. He says, Even though we often find it written that that a certain person reincarnated in this person, it's really a lot more complicated than that. Uh, don't make the mistake, don't think that it's the same, that one same soul, singular soul, reincarnating over and over again. That's not the case. That souls can have many different parts to them and roots, like we said, nefesh, ruach, neshama, chayan, nechida, yechida, and each of them can split into different parts. Uveshoret shechad mehem, yesh kaman netzotzot. Each of these things has many sparks in it, le'ein ketz. Uvechol gilgul vegilgul, nitkanim ktsat netzotzot mehem. So with each reincarnation, different sparks can be rectified. It doesn't have to be the whole soul reincarnating over and over again. You can fracture them, they can go into different bodies, and there are many different sparks. You can have different sparks from different... Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the Arizal will say that one person can actually contain two different sparks within them. So all the pieces can reincarnate in their own different parts. And again, we'll see examples of all those. And those that were already rectified, they don't have to reincarnate again. So those that have already been rectified, again, they can go to the wherever, to their olam haba. They don't have to come back in reincarnation. They can go straight to <clears throat> the resurrection of the dead. Right, yeah. So he can out, oh, right. This That's right. The typical answer why you can't know your past lives is because, for a few reasons. A, because then it would confirm that there is a God in this world, and then it would kind of remove free will from you. Because that will all get already prove that there is a soul. Then there's no question of, is there a God? Isn't there a God? There's obviously a God. There is a soul. So it, it diminishes your free will, essentially. God hid himself from the world so that we could have free will. If God is here, then it takes away from your free will. Everybody knows all spiritual things already. That's probably what's going to happen in Tchiyat HaMethim, in Olam Abba. But until then, God has to remain hidden, which means that your past life has to remain hidden. Otherwise, you lose that free will. Plus, if you know what you did in the past, it takes away from the suffering. Because then it's like, okay, well, yeah, I des- I'm getting what I deserved. That's it. So... It's, it's real suffering when it's, why am I suffering? I, don't, I did nothing wrong. That's suffering. When the punishment is not, you don't know why. If you knew why, it takes away from the, the suffering as well. So that's another answer to it. So I think that's, that's how usually people approach this idea. You can't know your past because it, it would kind of make things too easy. There would be no challenge. You'd know exactly why you came here for. I think the goal is to like try to perfect everything in one lifetime or like, to be a good person in all things, to fulfill all aspects of Torah in one life. Yeah, but it's, it's a good question. So I wanted to actually get into the examples of specific examples of reincarnation. I'll give you just one, just because I don't want to leave without an example, and then we'll end it. I think we'll go through it in more detail next time. But just to emphasize the point of what we're saying of three reincarnations or multiple reincarnations, and then what happens, there's a very interesting one. So we had Cain and Abel. Cain and Hevel. 
We know that Cain killed Abel. The Arizal says that Abel himself, heaven, he had a good part and a bad part, like most people. The hay part of heaven was a good thing, was, was rectified and was good. The Bet Lamed of heaven was not good. The Bet Lamed of heaven was, he, he himself wasn't so, they, they got into a fight for a reason, Cain and Abel, and Abel also did something that wasn't so good. And so the Bet Lamed of his was, it was a very strong part of his soul, but it was also contaminated. So the hay, the good part of his soul, went to Moshe. After being in some other people along the way. The Bet Lamed, the not so good part, went to Lavan. Lavan was the father-in-law of Yaakov, who was also a very wicked person and a sorcerer and who tricked Yaakov many times. So Lavan, the Lamed Bet of Lavan, came from Hevel. Hevel is Hey Bet Lamed. So the Bet and the Lamed, because the, your soul is attached to your name. We spoke about this before as well, right? Your Shem and your Neshama are intertwined. So the, your name can indicate what parts of souls you have. So the Bet Lamed of Hevel went to Lavan. It's also Lamed Bet. Lavan, of course, didn't rectify what he was supposed to and was even a worse sinner. So he had to reincarnate again. Second time. Who did he come back in? In Bilam. Bilam was the adversary of Moses. Remember Bilam, who tried to curse the Jewish people after the exodus in the wilderness. Bilam, also Bet Lamed. Right? Bet Lamed, Ain Mem. The same Bet Lamed from Hevel went to Lavan. Lavan messed it up, went to Bilam. Bilam, Bet Lamed, same. He was also a sorcerer, and he also messed up. So what happened to him? He got reincarnated again. Who did he get reincarnated into? Into Nava, the guy with Abigail, the first husband of Abigail the prophetess, who was later the wife of King David. Nava was this rich man in Carmel, and he, King David, was doing some security work for him, but Nava refused to pay him. And then King David got really upset and was going to go strike him down. And Abigail, of course, stopped him and said, no, don't do it. And she gave him a blessing. And that's where the source of reincarnation comes from. That's where the word kafakela is introduced. Because, so, reincarnation's there. And Naval was the reincarnation of Bilam, who was the reincarnation of Lavan, who was the reincarnation of Hebel. So that's three, right? Naval is the fourth. That's four generations. And he also messed up. And he also abused King David. So now what happens? Now he needs some kind of Gehenom, no? So he can't, he doesn't merit to come back again in another body. What happened to Naval HaKarmeli? Shekatuv bo veyamot libo bekirbo vehu ayala aven, la even. The verse says in, in Shmuel that Naval, when he died, it says his heart died in his heart. Veyamot libo bekirbo. His heart died. Probably had a heart attack. So he died by a heart attack. Vehu haya la aven. So the pshat is, when you read that verse, he became like a stone. His heart became a stone. He had a heart attack. His heart stopped, became like a stone. The Arizal is saying, no, 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 no. The sod here, the secret of this verse is, Naval reincarnated in an Evan. Now, after three failed reincarnations, now his Gehenom was to come back in a stone. That's what the Arizal is saying. And he explains, Vesoda Inyan, he explains, Ki Lavan Nidgalgel Bebilam, Vehagar Benavala Karmeli, and he explains this whole story. So that's just one example of how one, there's a per, wicked person, a negative example of the, the bad part of Hevel, of Abel, went into Lavan, then into Bilam, then into Naval, and that was strike three, then he went into a stone. That was his path of reincarnation. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we'll do the other half next time. What happened to Cain? Because Cain got reincarnated as well. And that's even far more interesting. And we're going to have to pinpoint why did Cain and Abel fight to begin with? Why did Cain kill Abel? What did Abel do wrong? We know what Cain did wrong. He killed Abel. What did Abel do to get killed? And then who did Cain reincarnate? And if Moshe was a partial reincarnation of Abel, who was... The, in his generation, the reincarnation of Cain. 
Right? So we'll have to see. So we'll leave that for next time, the whole soul journey of Cain. It's really fascinating. It's amazing. It involves a lot of intrigue and plot twists. So we'll save that for next time. Okay, thank you very much.